We're now going to apply the theory we just learned to prove what's called the lump sum principle, which is, which is one of the standard results in the simple neoclassical theory of the consumer. This has to do with taxes. So first we'll contrast lump sum taxes. with specific taxes and ad valorem taxes. In the following kind of way. The tax revenue of I'm gonna start with a specific tax. Sorry about that. Is just t times x if t is the tax rate and x is the amount of the good purchased. Uh, an ad valorem tax has the following formula t times px times x. So let me give examples of these two. A sales tax, like 5%, would be an ad valorem tax. So this is like a sales tax. Oops. Here's the reason. Px times x is in dollars. Because x is dollars per unit and x is units. So that's the total amount of money you spend. And the, a tax is also in dollars. So t must be dimensionless, like a percent. And so when the store charges you, when the government charges you 5% on, on a purchase of something that you made in the store, the t is 5%, and you take 5% and multiply it by the amount of money that you'd uh, otherwise give the store owner. The specific tax an example would be the gasoline tax. For example, 20 cents per gallon. This is not a... P so the tax rate here, this tax, is like 20 cents per gallon. In other words, it's not a percent. Even if the store owner decided to give you a gallon of gasoline for free, you'd still have to pay 20 cents per gallon for it. Whereas if it were a sales tax, like 5%, and the store owner gave you the product for free, you wouldn't have to pay anything because 5% of zero is zero. So a specific tax has, has units of dollars per the amount of the, a commodity, like, like cents per gallon or dollars per gallon. It's not a percentage. And you can see in the formula for the specific tax, the price of the good isn't in that mathematical formula. It's completely irrelevant. Whereas in the ad valorem tax, the price of the good, Px, is in the formula and is quite important. The mathematical formula for a lump sum tax is just T. In other words, it's a tax that is imposed regardless of how much of something you buy. It's not a function of your purchases of, of any particular commodity. It's not even a function of your income. Uh, in a lump sum tax is a situation where the government sends you a letter and says, please pay us 20 bucks, or please pay us $200, or $2,000. And it has nothing to do with what you did. So in this case, T is just in dollars, is a certain amount of dollars. Now, lump sum taxes are quite rare, and in, in fact, they don't really exist in the U.S. We'll talk a little bit later about what uh, real-world implications they have, but for now, let's concentrate on d getting the, the graph and mathematics set up for setting this lump sum principle. Two quick footnotes, though, about lump sum taxes. First is that a lump sum tax doesn't have to have the property that 
the government tells everybody in the entire economy to send them 20 bucks. The essence of a lump sum tax is that the amount of money you pay in taxes has nothing to do with something you, you can control. For example, it has nothing to do with how much of a commodity you buy. It might have something to do with something that you can't control. For example, uh, a law that says everybody above the age of 18 has to send the government 200 bucks. That's a lump sum tax because you can't control your age, whether you're above 18 or below 18. Or a law that says everyone whose height is above 6 feet has to send the government $100. That's also a lump sum tax because you can't you can't control your height. So the essence of a lump sum tax is it's a tax on a characteristic which the consumer can't control. Second just brief footnote about lump sum taxes is a synonym for lump sum tax is a poll tax. Now the phrase poll tax means two completely different things. One thing it means is a lump sum tax, and in particular a lump sum tax that is imposed on a very broad proportion of the population, for example all adults. You wouldn't call a tax that was imposed just on people who, whose height was greater than six feet a poll tax, but a tax imposed on, on the whole population would be, would be called a poll tax. The, but um, for better or for worse, the phrase poll tax also means something completely different. The phrase poll tax also means a tax on people who participate in elections. So you've heard that uh, elections are called uh, uh, polls, although polls now are also, th that word is also used to denote pre-election surveys. But you've heard of voters going to the polls, that means that means voters participating in an election. So a, uh, so a second meaning of poll tax is a tax on voters. There is an amendment to the United States Constitution which makes taxes on voters, that is this kind of poll tax, illegal in the United States. Poll tax in the the first meaning as a lump sum tax that that's not uh, that has nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's of course confusing that the term poll tax means two completely different things. The reason is because the word poll goes back to a Latin term that refers to the entire population, and the entire population is related both to elections and voting, so the second meaning of poll tax, and is related to, let's say, putting a tax on everybody who's above the age of 18, which is the first meaning of poll tax. So that's the reason why, historically, the term poll tax has come to mean two completely different things. We briefly want to set up a sketch of these taxes. Let's suppose that the original budget constraint BC1 is here, so BC1 has no taxes. And I want to compare lump sum taxes and uh, specific taxes in this example. So let's think about what the budget constraint of the specific tax would look like. You have income equals expenditures. So BC2 is going to be for the specific tax. Income equals expenditures. The expenditures are going to be PX times X, which is the amount of money you give the storekeeper when you buy X, then when you buy X you have to pay a tax on it and the specific tax is T times X and then you buy good Y. Let's solve this equation for Y. Well the first thing I want to do is collect the first two terms. We have PX plus T 
t times x plus py times y. So I think you can already see that it's going to look just like the standard budget constraint except the price of x instead of the price of x you have the price of x plus t. If we do that, I'm going to skip a few steps, but if, if we do this kind of quickly, you subtract this term from both sides of the equation and then divide by py, and let's see what you get. You get minus px plus t divided by py times x plus i divided by py equals y. So this is in the form mx plus b equals y. And the difference between the budget constraints we had before is that the, the slope, slope is now px plus t divided by py instead of being px divided by py. The slope is more negative. The numerator, px plus t, is bigger than the, the old numerator, which was just px. And so the numerator is bigger, the whole thing is bigger in absolute value, but this is a negative number, so it's more negative. So bc2 is going to look like this. If you don't buy any x, then the fact that you have to pay a tax on x doesn't matter. So if x is equal to 0, which is here, then the, the budget constraint bc2 is going to be exactly the same as bc1, because the difference between bc2 and bc1 is that in bc2 you have to pay a tax on x, but if you're not buying any x, then you're not paying any tax, and so the two budget constraints are exactly the same. And therefore the y-intercepts of these two are going to be the same. But, but if you buy a lot of x, then you're going to be able to purchase much less with this attacks on it than otherwise, and that's why the, this budget constraint twists in that direction. So it's as if the price of x has gone up, because to the consumer, the, the after price of x has gone up. So we have bc1, bc2. What I wanted to do is I wanted to compare, this is what the lump sum principle is about, the specific tax with the lump sum tax. So I need to draw in the lump sum budget constraint. The lump sum budget constraint is going to be BC3. Okay, so BC3 is going to be the lump sum budget constraint. It is not going to be easy to figure out where that lies. So let's finish the discussion of BC2, and then we'll uh, have another lesson where we talk about how to fit BC3 into this diagram. So finally for BC2 there'll be some indifference curve that's tangent to BC2 and we'll call the coordinates of this point x2 and y2 so x2 and y2 are the optimal place for this consumer to consume if he faces a specific tax. What we're going to do in the next lesson is figure out where on this diagram BC3 has to be drawn. And uh, then we'll be able to compare, compare these two.